Hello everyone and welcome to tonight's After Hours pre presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Candace Vinson and I am the Outreach and Events Coordinator at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science or as we call it, VIMS. Tonight's program is made possible by First Advantage Federal Credit Union, Marine Sonic Technology, LTD slash Atlas North America LLC, Philips Energy Inc., Chesapeake Bank, and Whitley Peanut Factory, as well as our many supporters of the VIMS Impact Fund. A portion of the work presented tonight has been made possible by the VIMS Dean and Directors Innovation Fund. The Innovation Fund was established in 2018 by the John and Morgan Massey Foundation and the Nunnally Charitable Trust with the goal of supporting VIMS researchers in the development of innovative ideas that solve real world problems and have the potential for ecological and economic impact. Dr. Kirk Havens received an award from this fund in 2020. Dr. Kirk Havens is the director of the Center for Coastal Resources Management or CCRM, which has a mission to support informed decision-making on resource management issues at all levels of government, including by private and corporate citizens. Dr. Havens has a BS in biology and an MS in oceanography from Old Dominion University and a PhD in environmental science and public policy from George Mason University. His research interests include tidal and non-tidal wetlands ecology and functional assessment, environmental law, public policy, and land use and watershed issues. His most recent work includes working with native Hawaiians and Polynesians on worldwide voyages to highlight the importance of oceans. And with that, I will hand it over to you, Dr. Havens. Thanks, Candice, for the inter introduction. Uh, thanks for everybody for joining in for this talk. And I'll just mention right off that some of the, uh, that William and Mary has actually um, obtained uh, intellectual property protections for some of the research that will be mentioned in this talk tonight. And, um, and we'll be talking about Plastics and bioplastics, uh, interesting terms that you'll hopefully get some additional information on. And so, so let's get into this. And uh, so whenever I start to talk about plastics, um, I think it's really, really important that we understand that plastics have uh, made our quality of life or enhanced it quite a bit. And they're, they're in all sorts of things. You can see the list. I, if I began making a list of everything the plastics are in, we would be here all night, but they have uh, enhanced our quality of life. We would not have the quality of life we have now without them. And, and in fact, we wouldn't even be having this talk right now on Zoom if it wasn't for plastics. So plastics are, are, have, a, have a real uh, utility in our lives. So, and it's because they're versatile, they're lightweight, they're flexible, and they're highly durable. So good news. Plastic is highly durable. The bad news, plastic is highly durable. And so it's really the kind of the end of life of plastic that, that is, a, is a real problem. And so I have some examples here, as you can see, like the plastic bottles, the straws, plastic bags, the single use items that uh, in reality, how long do you actually use these? You know, when you think about that, I mean, what, half an hour, 15 minutes for a bottle or a straw, or even the plastic bag, unless you recycle it um in your own home uh but th these are short time uses for for pieces of plastic or plastic items that will uh, last for decades maybe even longer and certainly uh in the landfills a lot longer so so we have to really think about the end of life of phase of plastics um when we talk about the problems of plastics the big ones and of course um the use of plastics has increased from about 50 million metric tons in 1977 to 350 to 40, 400 million metric tons in, in the recent history, you know, 2017 here. And uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember, I added in the famous movie, The Graduate, which is in the 1960s. And you'll remember the famous line from that, mu that uh, movie was, I wanna say just, I wanna say one word to you, just one word, plastics. So had you invested in plastics back then, uh, things had done pretty well. Um, and so, so obviously this has gone up. Plastics are continuing to be a huge use in our world. And, and, I, and I wanted to pull up this little statistic as well. And it was, it, it's fascinating to me because back in 1977, we used about 
about 389 million gallons of bottled water were sold. 389 million gallons of bottled water. But if you're in the 70s, 1970s, what was that bottled water? It's a different talk. We're talking about different bottled water. So for those of you who have probably already guessed, you know, bottled water back then, we we're really talking about the refillable, you know, five gallon bottles that were used for the office coolers. And, uh, you know, that's what, that's what we were dealing with back in the 70s when we were, when we were dealing with, with waters, water. And so um, now, however, you know, and so we're getting back in the 70s, 390 million gallons, mostly in the recycle, I mean, the refillable water cool bottles. Now, you know, in our times of 2017, close to 14 billion, billion gallons, and most of that in, um, in single bottle use plastic bottles. Uh, so if you, you can see the, the issue there. And of course, a lot of it ends up in uh, in landfills. The bulk of it ends up in landfills, but a, uh, a portion of it, and it's estimated around eight million tons, ends up in our in our oceans and waters uh, every year, traveling down our rivers and uh, either drainage systems or wherever, and ends up uh, deposited or collecting in our in our waterways. So when we talk about plastic, we need to also talk a little bit about microplastic. And uh, so we have plastic that gets washed around up in the, you know, around in the, in the oceans and our waterways. And plastic is, as we said, very, very durable. Um, it doesn't degrade in biodegrade, certainly. It doesn't really degrade. It, it will, however, over time, break into fragments. It'll begin to break apart. And it'll break into smaller and smaller pieces. And that's when we start talking about getting as it, you know as it gets in surf and it gets in other areas it begins to break apart this is a fascinating photo here of somebody surfing off a of java in java Indus, Indo, indonesia with all that plastic um in the uh, in the waves there and this is you know an area way out in you know way far out there that where there's a convergence of a lot of the plastic by currents just shows up and as as it continues to hit the shore and it and, uh, and it sits out there and begins to fragment and, and physically break apart. We again get these smaller and smaller pieces that are covering our beaches and in our waterways. And so this, that's when we're talking about plastics breaking into, into smaller and smaller pieces so we get the microplastics. Or microbeads, you've probably heard about in the past a little bit of the issue of uh, a, a, a actual microplastic microbeads being added to cosmetics and Things like lotions and um, lip gloss and and detergents, uh, deodorant, and uh, and and that was a problem too. Though there has been a, a ban on microbeads uh, in uh, purposely added to some of those that that um, was passed in the United States. But again, as you get uh, smaller and smaller, the smaller you are, the more things can ingest you, and so uh, that becomes a real problem as we start looking at plastic can move up through the food web and and uh and there's two issues here associated with plastics in the, in the in our waterways and our oceans and one of them is from just simply the plastic breaking apart um over time and the potential leaching of some of the additives that are that are put into plastics to meet certain properties that are necessary for the product and uh you know in many cases that might be flame retardants or there's PCBs and other other uh, type of toxins that are added to these uh, that when they they break apart and begin to leach out into the uh, into the into the water in the ocean, and then there's uh, already existing um, persistent organic pollutants floating around in our waterways, and so they're already out there. Now, persistent, you know, these organic pollutants, they are what we would call uh, you would call hydrophobic. They don't particularly like being in water. Uh, and plastic doesn't particularly is hydrophobic. It doesn't like being in water. So when you have two things that don't like being in water and they find each other in the oceans, they glom on together. They adsorb together. And uh, in the longer you float around out there, the greater chance uh, plastics are going to run into these persistent organic pollutants that are going to adsorb or glom onto them. And so you can end up seeing where this can be a real problem as things, small things begin, it begins to get ingested and move up through the food web. In our own work, we had here we have uh, just to give you an example. This is a 
a, um, a bamboo tube worm. They're pretty common in our in our benthic or our uh, uh, benthic of our waterways in the bay and such. And here's one that has ingested um, uh, polyethylene beads. Uh, and also, you look down here, it goes from the kind of the smallest here to the largest. This was that uh, whale that was found dead in Virginia Beach a while back, and they pulled a piece of jagged plastic from it. And uh, that was, uh, we, I think that was a cassette casing, a casing for cassette, a video cassette. But um, from the kind of the smallest to the largest here. Oh, yes, and wor you know, worst news ever, you know. Microplastics found in beer, and it, you know, can it get any bad worse than that? Uh, and so, all these issues associated with plastics and, and microplastics, we were asked to kind of figure out solutions for this. And, uh, and so, we we looked at a number of different, particularly for things associated with the marine environment. We looked at a number of potential solutions, and ended up with a, um, a, a polymer called polyhydroxyalkanoic, or PHA. And uh, there are, it's one of the few truly biodegradable um, polymers out there. And it's important to understand that there's a lot of confusion over the terms biodegradable, uh, compostable, compostable industrial compost heaps. Uh, and, and so you have to be kind of careful on when something's being uh, photodegrading, and that's another one, when someone's calling something biodegradable. This polyhydroxyalkanoate, however, PHA, is truly biodegradable and the fact that it's already naturally produced by bacteria in the in the in the environment. And the bacteria produce PHA as these small granules in which they store energy. And it's kind of like when we we produce fat to, you know, to store energy. And so when the PHA comes into contact in the environment, uh, the, the bacteria recognizes that the food and uh, the food source and will consume it. And it ends up having, you know, breaking it down then in the, the components of biomass, uh, CO2, and water. And so back into the carbon cycle. And so it's really interesting uh, polymer in the sense that uh, when it gets in, and they've, some studies have shown that when it's in the digestive system of, of some shellfish and fish, um, the, in the digestive system, it breaks down into short-chain fatty acids. And short-chain fatty acids add the, uh, a level of immunity to certain pathogenic bacteria. And so what it's actually uh, being used for in some cases uh, internationally in some of the large intensive aquaculture ponds that um, with the growth of the animals in really close proximity, they're being added to the feed stock. PHA is being added to the feed in order to help lower the incidence of, in, of disease in those uh, intensive ponds. And so Remember the term short chain fatty acids, because we're going to come back to that later on in this presentation. And um, and of course, uh, you know, groups of like MIT and, and other and other organizations have figured out how to harvest this polymer and uh, and then um, extrude it. And once you can extrude something and mold something, then you can actually uh, you know get some uh, interesting products out of it. And it's FDA, FDA has proved it for internal uh, sutures and medicine activity, like the covers of pills, um, and also um, it's uh, ASTM certified to degrade in the marine environment. So this is a very interesting polymer. So we use that, we were asked to actually look at the issue of derelict crab pots, the Dungeness crab pots out in the, on the West Coast, and to try to uh, help them with a solution on those derelict pots, which continue to capture when they're lost, they can just stay out there and continue to capture and kill not only the target species, the Dungeness crab, but, but other animals as well that get into these. And, um, you know, just uh, there's several million of these Dungeness pots are deployed annually, and uh, they estimate about 12,000 are lost annually just in the Salish Sea or Puget Sound area. And the crabs in these derelict pots are estimated to. Uh, to equal about four and a half percent the value of the of the total harvest, and so um, it's interesting in that these dungeon uh, pots already ha are required to have a mechanism to uh, an escape mechanism, a degradable ex escape mechanism, and that is, is what's called a rot cord. And this is a, a cotton cord that's used to help tie down the lid or the you know, opening where they will get the crabs out of once they harvest them. And, uh, but the problem with it is that uh, it has you know, fairly, pretty variable break times. 
and it's you know really hard to replace if you're wearing gloves to try to retie that back on and and once it's broken it's not that great of a, a mechanism for um the crabs to get out so we're going to have to help with these uh in these two areas to see if we could come up with a a solution that might work with the biopolymer that we're working with the pha <clears throat> and so and you know, again if you look at this this diagram here this is the lid that is latched down and it's latched down with that rot cord but again it requires that the crab actually climb up here and push that open in order to get out so it can it can be a and then things can encrust on it and steam in it kind of down so it can be a problem over time for things to get out and these stainless steel dungeness crab pots are estimated the last seven ten years they're they're pretty durable and so what we were looking at is a possible mechanism for this is that in order to get into this into this dungeness pot the crab comes in this funnel and then it pushes against this little gate that's hinged and this little gate swings open and they can go into the trap uh, but these tines here at the bottom of this gate are long enough that it, it, if they try to go back, those tines are blocked and they can't they can't swing outward. And so they are held together, or these these gates are held on there with these uh, non degradable polypropylene um, uh, hinges. And uh, so or the concept was, well, if we replace those hinges with the biodegradable polymer, then uh, then over time uh, these will degrade. And uh, that gate will just simply fall to the bottom of, of the trap, and then the crabs can go in and out of that, that funnel in, entrance. And uh, and so so we did work with it. We you know, created these, built these out, and uh, to and began the install well installation on them. And we were actually working with, like I say, groups in uh, uh, both fishers and groups uh, in the um, in Alaska and uh, Washington State. Where they were installed, and and they'll be they'll be working on that again this summer when they have a relatively short um, season, but they'll be out this summer uh, testing those again and seeing if they would they'll be a, 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 a appropriate um, alternative or actually really a redundancy type of mechanism since they're already required to have some type of degradable component on here. There's an interest in having some backup stuff in case that that uh, that uh, rock core doesn't work. So we'll see how that um, plays out this time. There'll, there's some independent groups that are testing this, and then they will get a report back. <clears throat> but while we were working on that, we had on um, the issue of uh, trying to, to work on an issue to try to make it so that derelict fishing gear um, won't continue to capture and, and kill things once they're lost, we are contacted a, from a number of groups about an issue of called um, a plastic shotgun loss. And this is this is interesting because we are contacted by sportsmen and hunters and uh, coastal cleanup people, who people that go out and pick up the plastics along their beaches and such. And they came back saying they keep finding all of these out there. And so what they actually are, if for those of you that are not familiar with a shotgun shell, is it's a it's a piece of plastic sits here in the in the standard you know that hole the the shell that's red with the brass bottom that you see you can see out there it's internal to that and it separates the powder down here from the shot which is then shot outward and so um so while hunters and sportsmen can pick up generally do pick up the uh the the actual shell itself let me go back one oops let me go back one the um the wad is propelled out with the pellet and you know it goes 20 or 30 yards and it's really hard for any hunter to actually go and recover that and uh, so it's not really practical for them to do that they can pick up that shell that is ejected next to them but getting that wad back is not a practical solution to try to find it and and so um so we were asked can we figure out a a uh, use our polymer to try to uh, come up with a solution for this plastic wad pollution issue and there are lots of them out there plastic wads and so in fact they are they have been being ingested by animals you know ocean foraging birds unfortunately here's an albatross and uh, as part of its stomach contents there's there's a, a shotgun wad and again, you know, it, even at, even if it's not ingested as a wad, it'll break down again into the microplastics and get into uh, 
go up the food web. But interestingly enough, we were also contacted by uh, cranberry bog farmers who uh, obviously, you know, they, they have uh, where, their, where their bogs are, there's a lot of waterfowl hunting will take place. And all they need is one little piece of plastic in their uh, bog harvest and, and a, the cranberry bog option will ruin, ruin their entire harvest. So they were, they're very interested in trying to have some type of solution that will they'll be a substitute for the waterfowl hunting that will keep pla the, the non-degradable plastics out of their bogs. And there was issues associated with some of these crops that come up like broccoli that come up in the fields. The, the, you know, a lot of farmers will rent their fields out to hunting clubs and then these wads are scattered in there and they'll end up in these broccoli heads. And so there is a, you know, interest from that uh, industry as well to try to find a, a viable solution to this. So we did work on this and, oh, oh, before I go to that, oh, this is even worse. Uh, this is the, uh, this is shot, well, they're all different types of shotgun wads. They come in all forms. And this is one of them that, you know, looks really kind of nasty. And the problem is, that cattle will also are considered indiscriminate grazers and they'll pick these up when they're out grazing and ingest them. And so ranchers uh, were concerned about this too. And of course, the hunters that, uh, that um, lease the land to um, hunt on from the ranchers were concerned because the ranchers are beginning to say, hey, we don't want this stuff shot on our land where it can get into one of our you know $5,000 cows or whatever. And, uh, and this causes a this is kind of an issue called a, a hardware disease. And it's a, it's a very interesting, fascinating thing. And it's in the past, since cows will pick up basically anything, you know, from the ground as they're grazing, they used to pick up things like uh, fencing nails or pieces of wire fence. They'll get, you know, end up in the, they'll ingest it and end up in their stomachs. And the problem would be because they have such a strong uh, stomach muscles when they're, you know, when they're in the ruminants with their, when they're uh, digesting their food and their in the cud, and, and, and the muscle can contract and it can poke that nail or that, that piece of fence wire or whatever out out of the stomach lining and impact other organs in the cow. And so, um, one of the solutions for that that veterinarians use is they develop this magnetic, basically a magnetic pill, and that's uh, ingested into the cow and gets into the cow's stomach. And that that'll glom on or you know gets the metal and uh, to attach to it and uh, keeps it away from the, the stomach uh, uh, lining or stomach wall and helps protect the cow that way. Um, I don't really know how they get it out. I didn't ask, and I don't really want to know if they ever do. But uh, but um, the problem, of course, is that it doesn't work for plastic. Um, you know it, that that type of a solution, a magnet magnet, doesn't work for plastics, and so that's a real problem. Now, I said at the beginning to remember short-chain fatty acids, and so now you also have to remember hardware disease. We're going to come back to that. So anyway, there was a real interest from a number, a suite of industries and, and uh, constituents on, you know, how can we, can we help solve this problem? So we worked on it, and we ended up uh, having a prototype uh, wad with a, out of a biopolymer bio blend, and, um, and and then and, and you can see our, our this is uh, the prototype wad and uh, and how it compares to the existing competitors that are out on the market and it compares pretty well <laughs> and uh, and in fact for this the uh, technology uh, for this particular biodegradable wad um, has been acquired by a uh, uh, a company that's a leader in this uh, industry leader in this and so um that one and that one has actually has been uh, um, obtained and, and is in, in the process of with a with a uh, ammunition company um so but while we were doing this uh we were approached with people asking well what about the the um the plastic netting that's used in erosion control you, you see along the highway all the time and uh, you know uh, the highway department, DDOT, and all when they're constructing a road and uh, or putting in a new ditch or whatever, they'll come in and they and they lay down this um, uh, netting, uh, usually with some type of straw in it or whatever. But this netting is laid down to try to hold it, hold and maintain that bare ditch until you can get a strong uh, uh, vegetation growing in it. And and uh, and the problem is is that again it's non-degradable. It lasts for a really, really long time. 
lots of things get tangled in it. Snakes are notorious for getting tangled in it. Uh, and so there's, there's a real problem associated with, one, the fact that it's there for decades, uh, even after the vegetation has come up and it's done its job of stabilizing the bank. Uh, but it also can, continues to, uh, to trap and entangle uh, wildlife. And so there was, a, there was an interest in trying to see if there, there was a way to you know, take the biopolymer and make it into a netting form. And uh, so we began working on that. Um, and, and what we found was, um, is that when, when this is actually, when the, when the um, netting, the biopolymer is being uh, metabolized by the bacteria, uh, it it'll it, it, it takes and transfers uh, transforms nitrate into nit nitrogen gas. Which that means is that that you know, nitrogen is a pollutant that can be in, in abundance can be a real problem with uh, algae blooms and then ultimately uh, fish kills. And so if there was a, a you know way to keep, get nitrate and nitrogen out of the water column as the water's traveling down to our streams and our rivers, that's a great out and uh, and so we were we looked at this and of course VDOT would be is very interested in that because they're looking at ways that are in it, uh, uh, ways that maybe they could stabilize their their banks and their construction sites they could uh, get the growth uh, the plant growth going uh, they can have this pro the netting eventually go away once the grass is in there and the vegetation has grown and it won't continue to entangle and trap things and it could remove pollutants as it moves down towards the um, towards the water, uh, the waterway, and so we actually had um, uh, we did we did some work. We worked with VDOT. They provided us a lot of really good suggestions, and um, and on uh, what was necessary to make to make this work in their world. And so we did some testing, and sure enough, uh, you know you could find that placing that that type of a, um, a netting in the ditch. Uh, was reduced the concentration of nitrate by back a factor of two, and so we we uh, continue to work with the advice from uh, the VDOT who are, who are interested in seeing if this could possibly work, and uh, but we needed to work on the developing kind of the tensile strength and some of the elasticity associated with it to meet some of the criteria. So we partnered with our colleagues at Virginia Tech and um, to continue to work on this, and that's where that process is at this moment. But while we were working with our colleagues at Tech, as anybody that from Tech probably knows, they wanted to say, well, what about hay bales? Uh, you know, hay bales, there's something called a hay bale wrap, and this is these big circular hay bales you see out in the field. They're generally wrapped with a, um, a netting that's very similar to what's used in that erosion control netting on the side of the roads and ditches. And, um, and so they wanted to know, well, you know, can, can, that be, can that be substituted? Because right now it's a non-degradable netting that's wrapping these bales up. And the problem with that is, you know, for one, this net, they, they, they put these hay bales out there as to, for winter fodder for their cattle. Um, and uh, the problem is that, is that as you have these hay bales stuck out there and then the, when they go to actually we take the hay and make it available for the cattle. In many cases, the netting is frozen to the hay bales. And so in order to get it off the hay bales and try to rip it off or cut it off, a lot of it gets remains entangled and remains in the hay bale. And uh, I mentioned your, the remember a hardware disease. So here's another real problem. Uh, it gets into the fodder and the feed associated with the cattle and the cattle ingest it. And because it's all kind of this netting, it gets all tangled up in the stomach as the stomach convulses in the in the uh, in the cow or the ruminant, and so um, and then here's just a you know kind of a disgusting shot of uh, what 18 pounds of net wrap that was pulled out of a dead cow, eight year old cow, and so if there was a way that we could you know do that get this netting uh, to be biodegradable and not have an impact uh, when it's ingested by cows or or goes away. That would be the ranchers were very interested in that, and so we worked with our team from Virginia Tech, and um, and of course here's the famous cows that have uh, portals in them, and um, and we're working on uh, how how it might affect uh, a cow if it's ingested. And again, here's where I told you you needed to remember short chain fatty acids again. And apparently in cows, 
uh, in the digestive system, they break down their food into sh- it breaks down into short chain fatty acids, their normal field food, and that's where they get the, the the main part of their metabolism or their energy from is short chain fatty acids. So we're, it's interesting that this could be actually a, a benefit or at least not a harm to cattle if it's ingested. And uh, we're, so it has a similar type of um, metabolism associated with obtaining energy for short-chain fatty acids. And so um, in this particular case, we continue to work on that. Uh, Virginia Tech is uh, out there testing that now, and uh, we will see how that plays out. Um, so, uh, so I'm getting close to my time and uh, wrapping this up. And so I wanted to just go a quick recap. You know, so we went from plastics and microplastics and, you know, for me, marine ecology and, of course, beer. And we went down to uh, the issue of degradable escape mechanisms for abandoned fishing gear. That led us, you know, to that and trying to develop a solution for that, which then led us to a biodegradable shotgun wads and cherry cranberry bogs. And then uh, erosion control and hay bale netting and bovine intestines. And so for all the young, you know, potential scientists out there, the youth out there, this is just to get to show you where, where the wonderful world of science can lead you if you get curious and you want to head down these paths. Uh, so uh, I think that is the end of my talk. Yes, it is. And so I guess, uh, Candace, I turn it back over to you. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Havens. That is so cool how one small thing can lead to another and it just really shows and reinforces how interdisciplinary marine science really is. And it's it's a global issue rather than just a microcosm issue. So thank you so much. Um, this question is kind of interesting because I had the same one. How long does it take something made from these PHAs to break down in the environment or does it depend on the environment? That's a great question. And yes, it does depend on the environment. So there is bacteria um, that metabolizes PHA in all the different climes. But as with anything, as, a, as you get colder, <clears throat> it takes longer. And, uh, and so um, that, 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 that is an issue. There is a, it will break down slower in colder climes, but so does everything, so does cellulose. Uh, uh, and so um, it, can, it depends on, of course, the thickness. And uh, you can go in uh, months, it could, and the thicker it is, it could take uh, years. We would try to design the actual netting for the, uh, for instance, for the VDOT and working with Virginia Tech, trying to de- design that netting so that it will break down after probably two years. So you get a full kind of couple growing seasons for the vegetation to come into those ditches. And, uh, and so that would be one aspect. For the Dungeness crab hinges, it would probably need to go in a you know three to six months or something like that when they break down. So it really it really comes down to how how thick um, you want to make it, uh, and uh, and that will determine that and the climate will determine how long it will last. Um, so sort of on that note, um, cost wise, so this is going to be a reoccurring cost, correct? So that's one negative as opposed to plastics that would might last longer. So is this a reoccurring cost for, you know, installing it on gear, replacing it every few months, or will it last longer if it's re- like, like the crop pots, if they're taken out and stuff, it lasts longer, right? So that wouldn't really impact it too much. Well, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a valid point. I mean, th- you're talking about something that will go away. And so it's, um, you know, over time, it will biodegrade, and uh, it may it may last longer if it's not exposed in the water to bacteria. But over time, it will go away, and so it is a reoccurring cost. And um, but so for some of the things though, like for instance, shotgun wads, you don't really use those again. You know, so um, it would be useful to have those that uh, you know that that go away. They're a, they're a single use item as well. Uh, for something like the the hinges, you would have to replace those periodically on the on the uh, Dungeness crab pots. Um, Material-wise, PHA is still more expensive, of course, than uh, your typical polyethylene or polypropylene, and that's that's one of those things that the you know the cost comes down with the uh, uh, bulk of the material made. The larger quantities are being made, eventually the prices come down. But, you know, obviously um, uh, uh, a company, like we said with the shotgun was, has made that determination that 
the cost is uh, the slight increase in cost to the shot shells uh, um, is probably going to be offset by the the importance of being um, not polluting, providing plastic pollution. <clears throat> Yeah, very good point. Um, so what about the fishing gear used on eastern shores? So would they be able to use it out there? I'm not sure that they, I don't think there's any Dungeness crabs uh, out there, but, but uh, you know, with the polymer uh, could be used if there's a, some type of adaptation that's necessary uh, or useful for some of the, if there's fishing gear on the eastern shore, whether it's like clam netting, maybe they're thinking about something like that. There's, uh, you know, clam netting is uh, another um, uh, issue that could be, could be, this could help with, um, you know, so it depends on what the utilization with, but it, the, poly, the biopolymer, like I say, is ubiquitous. It, 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 bacteria produce it everywhere. So wherever you put it, there will be bacteria that will, that will consume it. <clears throat> Do these biodegradable plastics, so the PHAs, need water to degrade or would they work in arid environments? Yeah, that's a really good question too. Um, they generally uh, will to degrade the, the quickest. Will will need to be moist or have water. They will degrade in an upland uh, terrestrial situation. They'll degrade faster in a water situation. Uh, but you know, there's bacteria in the in the in the soil that will metabolize it. There's bacteria in the water that will metabolize it. You get it out in the desert. That's not something we I've tested or even seen research on. But I suspect it would be, you know. It would be a, a lot slower in, a, in something like that. <clears throat> it's a good question, though. Um, and then we have a question. So last year, a lecture informed us about the microplastics observed in marine animals. Are we observing any microplastics in land animals or food sources? So we know the, the larger plastics are in there, but have we seen any microplastics in maybe cows or anything? Oh. Yeah, you know, um, I don't know the answer to that. I'll, I'll have to look into that. I do know that, of course, you know, we, you know, they found a lot of microplastics in a lot of the marine organisms, like I think the, the writer uh, mentioned. Um, and I suspect, though, that you know, you could, you could arguably say that, you know, for some of the cows, uh, even that, that netting that's at all that big mass of netting that was in the stomach, that's what you could see. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of smaller pieces that are broken or fragmented that are, that are in there as well. Um, I don't know of any, you know, like if you're saying like we've seen it in chicken, you know, chicken meat or something like that. But if we're seeing it in beer, that should be worrisome enough, you know. So um, we'll have to, I'll have to look into that. Yeah, there's a lot when it comes to plastic. So I know it's a very expansive topic. Um, is uh, so how do you harvest the PHA is another question that we have. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so we don't, you know, so uh, we didn't actually invent the uh, polymer that was invented decades ago, or it wasn't really invented, but it was, it was determined how you could best harvest it and, uh, and get it out of bacteria um, decades ago by, I could say, MIT and some companies. And uh, they, I, my understanding is it is in a big vat like uh, a system where they uh, they can then they provide a carbon source to the bacteria, which then convert and produce the small granules of PHA. And a really interesting one, um, if you have a chance to check it out, is a company in California, and um, they actually uh, it's called Mango Materials, and they actually use waste methane from landfills as the carbon source. To feed the bacteria to produce the PHA, so it's a you know, it's a really uh, interesting closed cycle type of way to to, to do it. And so um, again, you know, uh, mostly it's done with plant material to fed the bacteria. But like I say, there are some other avenues such as uh, as mango that's using waste methane as the carbon source. Gotcha. Wow. Um, so someone wants to know if they're similar to the styrofoam nodules that dissolve in water. Or is it? Oh, yeah. No, you know. So, so it does require uh, the uh, PHA do require a bacteria enzyme to metabolize it. So that's a is an enzymic reaction where they're we're breaking it down. Those so things that just dissolve in water, you have to be very careful because they could be what called P POVs, which which actually uh, are not that great. And so um, it depends on what it, if it's starch. Okay, that's not probably that's probably not a problem. But if it's uh, 
some of these other um, potentially uh, degradable uh, bioplastics, it's really important to see what, what they are. Um, so so I, I don't really know the answer to that, other than I can tell you that the PHAs do require bacteria and the enzymes that they, they put out to actually metabolize it and, and, and dissolve it, or actually, they're actually consuming it. Um, so we have a couple of questions coming in about actually how you create products with this. So you purchase the PHA and then um, do you mold it or can you use 3D printers to extrude it and create plastic products that in that manner? Uh, good. We have some inventors already thinking about how they might you know, do something like this. Yeah. So. Uh, uh, generally, what we do is we ended up we end up uh, having to work with CAD drawers and then and and uh, CAD drawings and then get it to a molder and then its molds are made and then it's extruded. Um, but but the the, the actual um, printers, 3D printers are really coming online. In the earlier days, when we were working on this, there wasn't a pot. There there was you have to have a filament in order to feed it into your your 3D printer, and they couldn't get these filaments to be made out of PHA to work just, you know, get them in the right diameter to, to really fit into these um, 3D printers. They, they have gotten much better at that now. And, uh, and so what we've kind of moved toward is we can take uh, a, a polymer that's very similar to, to PHA, it's called PLA, and, we, and they do make uh, nice filaments out of that. And we can so test kind of what the, how it would look like through 3D printers and then once we get to the point where we're satisfied with the design, you can then go and, and substitute in the uh, PHA. But the PHA is a lot harder to deal with with um, the uh, uh, filaments and, and, and putting it into a 3D printer. And that's mainly because it has a, it has a pretty finicky melting point and you have to be care careful with that. <clears throat> oh, but yes, okay. three, you know, ultimately if you have ideas and you can take, you, know, you can easily get PLA. Uh, PLA is considered degradable, but it's really biodegradable only in like industrial uh, compost heaps. So you need a really high heat source. But you can certainly test your ideas with a, if you have them with a with a three D printer on uh, using PLA. Hmm. Okay, that's cool. Again, on this note, does sunlight will sunlight degrade this type of plastic as well? Will that have any impact in it, or does it like? No, again, it's. No, it's not photodegradable. So it's again, it's 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 uh, bacteria mediated. So uh, you have to have the bacteria, and the bacteria will break it down. So it, it will slowly crystallize over time, which makes it slightly more brittle uh, if it's you know for for a fair amount of time over a, uh, a year or so or something like that. It'll get a little bit more brittle as it crystallizes, but it still requires the bacteria to break it down. And then we have someone that says, if it works for erosion control netting, maybe it could be used in sod farmers that grow turf grass for the horticulture industry. So turf grass for sod, farm, for sod, do you think it could be used for that? Well, I'm not exactly how they do that, but if they, if they have, if they, I think I understand what they're saying that they usually they have some type of uh, a base to that uh, sod and it's laid down and uh, kind of get it in the on the in the soil. So certainly, if there's if there's plastic netting or plastics associated with uh, non-degradable plastic associated with the sod farming, yeah, I would see that that would be a, a real reasonable um, alternative. Another one that we're working on too is the issue of um, oyster bags. You know, these people put out oyster bags kind of as, as a shoreline defense structure. You know, they put a oyster bag, a bag full of oyster shells, and and uh, in hopes that then that oysters will um, uh, grow on these things and kind of make a barrier along your edge of your marsh or your shoreline. But right now, they use generally they're using plastic uh, uh, bags to do that, and so ultimately, in the end, that begins to break apart, and you're adding you know microplastics and plastics to the environment. So this, however, hopefully, if you get the tensile strength and all right would last long enough that uh, the oysters can, you know, cement themselves and grow there. And then over a couple, uh, over a couple seasons, then it would just be degraded away by the bacteria and you wouldn't have any ruminants of the plastic. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, so on that note, do you have any other products that you're thinking of, or is that information you want to disclose? Like, any other ideas oh, I, that you think? We do have other short term. We do have other products. 
<laughs> and uh, we are thinking about, um, yeah, so there, there, there are a lot of potentials out there, but, you know, PHA is not a, uh, a magic bullet. I mean, it, it only, it has certain characteristics that work in certain situations, but it, for instance, it's really difficult to make it like into a bag or, you know, that, that's a plastic bag or a bottle. Um, you know, that's, that's a hard one. Uh, the Navy actually worked on uh, using it, uh, developing um, uh, plastic wear in a sense of, you know, PHA wear uh, for their, uh, for their ships uh, so that they could dispose of it at sea. Um, so there are a number of different things. There's, uh, there's somebody working on making it as a really, really, PHA as a really, really thin, thin layer to put on cardboard, the interior of cardboard boxes. Cause you, you get these cardboard boxes that you think are recyclable, but they've got some a plastic, uh, you know, coating on the interior, and that that messes that all up. So there are companies that are looking at using PHA as that as that coating, uh, and uh, which would be really 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 helpful as well. So yeah, there are a lot of things to think about. Um, you got to recognize though that again, you know, for PHA it, it has limited use, uh, but we found some uses that it, it just seems to work really well for particularly if it's something you want ultimately in a year or so or less to go away. And, uh, you know, and that, and that is kind of the, the issue of, of having to deal with, again, as we started to talk off with, with is the end of life of plastic. You need to begin to think, think about it when you're producing this product out of plastic. What is the end of life of it? What is the time frame and where does it go? Gotcha. So, yeah, and we have a couple questions that, are sort of asking that. So uh, you mentioned it's not a magic bullet. So it's not gonna overnight solve the plastics problem. That's what you're saying. It, it's not gonna be our source to magically replace all plastics, but it's a step in that direction. Yes, yes, that's right. It, you know, the solving the plastic problem is going to be a, uh, you know, a whole bunch of different, you know, from the recycling into, you know, to, to um, you know, there's going to be and to actually not using or reusing or changing the the mindset on how you how you think about a product from its conception to the to the cradle, you know. So it's just another tool to help reduce the number amount of plastics uh, that are that are entering the environment. And we hope it will be a you know, it's a pretty good tool. Um, but again, it's it's just uh, one uh, prong in the in the number of prongs that are needed for this problem. <clears throat> Yes, yeah, we had a few people saying it's uh, taking a proverbial cup of water out of the ocean as it's being filled with a fire hose. So that was their concern. But it seems like it's a little bit more hopeful with that than the uh, than that with the PHA. Like it seems like it could have a bigger impact than just a small footprint on the plastics issue. Um, and yeah, and it'll hopefully so, grow. It'll grow over time. You know so. Yeah, and so on that, uh, has there been any data, like, has any of that um, been found to aid in the support, supporting the transition to biodegradable materials? So, you know, um, how much field data has been found to aid in supporting the transition to these biodegradable materials? Um, so, I'm not really sure about the question. Um, how much field data? I think it's how much of an impact will this have, like um, oh, in supporting, oh. like how receptible yeah, has the industry been to changing to biodegradable plastics? Like I know that you covered a lot yeah. of different industries, so. Yeah, yeah, I see. Uh, yeah, there there has been some data out there. You can find it on there, and you can just search polyhydroxyalkanoate, and, and there's a there has been a you know a number of publications on. You know uh, the percentage of the bioplastic world that PHAs are in. You know, and, and how and how much. Um, and it's fairly small at this point. Uh, and what the potential growth uh, curves are for it uh, in the industry. And um, there are a number of companies that are actually producing PHA now. And uh, so there, it's it's gaining it's gaining um, gaining traction. Uh, and uh, again, as I stated earlier is the more uses that are found and the more production it is, the price comes down and hopefully it'll be, it'll be, there'll be more applications for it. And, uh, and while, you know, it may be, uh, you know, a couple cups out of the ocean, it's still a couple cups. And so um, if we all get a couple cups out, eventually you'll hopefully knock it down. 
Yeah. Um, we also have someone who is concerned. Um, apparently, there's been some talk that um, some bioplastics contain toxic chemicals, just like non-bioplastics do. So they're asking, have you, like, is it possible to check? Have you checked, like, the base or the additives in PHA for, you know, toxic chemicals, especially if it's, you know, putting, if you're putting it in cows. Oh, yeah. That, yeah, that, that's a really good question. And, it, and, it, and it's a question that people have to always ask. There's no, you could certainly add, uh, you know, bad additives to PHA, just like any other thermal plastic that it's when it's being molded. And so it's really important to know what's actually, what additives are being put into the, put into these, not only just the non-degradable plastics, but the ones that are called bioplastics or biopolymers. However, for what, you know, for what uses we're looking at when we're trying to work on the, the different um, uh, structural or physical characteristics to meet a particular task, uh, there are some truly na natural uh, additives that you can use, such as gelatin is one, or um, a common, another one is uh, chitin, which is uh, commonly found, uh, commonly uh, you know, associated with crab shells. And so there are natural benign additives that can be put into the, uh, into, to reach some of the characteristics that are necessary in the biopolymer. But it's an excellent question. And, it, and I think you know, California is on that track of trying to require that if you're calling something a biodegradable, you need to tell us what's in it. And, uh, and so that's a big fight because in some cases this is proprietary information and the companies don't want it out, but it's a, it's a really important issue. So then we have a couple just really fast, or this, uh, we have a lot more questions, but there's one um, that I kind of want to address and I don't know if um, you necessarily know it off the top of your head, uh, but do you know of the main source of plastic pollution in terms of environmental contamination? Oh, wow. Globally in the U.S.? Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't really know. don't know. Uh, the, the main source, um, you know, so I guess that, most that's a really good found. question. Well, yeah, there, then there's commonly found. And I mean, if you're looking at, you know, what is uh, by mass or by unit, you know, I think that in a lot of cases by unit, at least in the United States, it's cigarette, cigarette butt. Um, and uh, the because they actually contain plastic, and uh, and so that's a big, big one. But that's a but by mass, uh, there would be it would probably be something different. Um, so I I don't know off the top of my head uh, what that is, but uh, certainly um, you know it, it would be important to determine whether you want it, but you're trying to figure it by mass or by by uh, individual unit. And I do think that at least in the U.S., cigarette butts are kind of like the the one that they're found all the time. Gotcha. Yeah. So that is our time. If you have any questions that you didn't hear answered, please uh, email us at programs at vims.edu if you'd like to hear that answered. And if you would like to help support research like Dr. Kirk Havens is doing, you can contribute to the VIMS Innovation Fund or any other uh, fund at, get, at VIMS. You can make a gift at vims.edu slash giving. And if you want to talk to someone at VIMS about giving opportunities and way that you can, ways that you can help out, feel free to email us at programs at vims.edu. And thank you so much, Dr. Havens. And thank you everyone for joining. And we will see you next time. Thank you.